Hello and welcome to the NBA Outlet Award Show presented by OTGBasketball.com. I'm your host, Nick Faye. With me as always, Corey Waldron and special guest, Jonathan Ibrahim. What's up, fellas? Hey, guys. I'm excited to be back. It's uh, my favorite time of the year. It's award time and the season. The playoffs are around the corner, so let's get at it. If you don't agree with me, you're wrong. <laughs> Uh, it's going to be an interesting episode. If you guys uh, recall, Jonathan was on the NBA award show to start the season, giving our predictions. So you want to check out who we predicted and whatnot. You can look back at that on iTunes, Block Talk Radio, OTGBasketball.com, and Google Play. As well, the new episodes will be on Dash Radio, but let's get started. Plenty of awards to talk about. We're going to go through Rookie of the Year, Sixth Man, Defensive Player of the Year, Most Improved, Executive of the Year, Coach of the Year, and finally MVP. But let's start with Rookie of the Year. You know, this started as maybe a three-headed race, then it got into maybe one-headed race, then back to two. Who is your Rookie of the Year right now, guys? Who's going to win the award? Well, for me, I went with Ben Simmons. Uh, it seems almost like an obvious pick at this point with uh, some of the performances he's put in towards the end of the season. But, uh, you know, I want to give a shout-out to Donovan Mitchell. He surprised a lot of people. He surprised everybody, I think, except for himself. And uh, he had a great rookie season. But I think that extra experience that Ben Simmons has uh, in his redshirt year, that's what's paid, paved the way for him. He's averaging around 17 points and eight assists, which I think is you know, crazy for a rookie. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, yeah, those numbers are insane. And, and I think those are those were the numbers that, you know, some people had thought that Lonzo Ball was going to put up uh, when uh, the hype around him first started. Uh, we saw how that worked out. But, I mean, 17 and eight, and then his, his efficiency from the field is what separates him from Donovan Mitchell, in my, in my opinion. Uh, you know, he's shooting about 10% better from the field. You know, he's just an overall more well-rounded player. So I got to give it to Ben. Is he really shooting though? No, I'm just I'm, That was my only joke. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, I, I picked Donovan Mitchell and I picked him two weeks ago or three weeks ago, whenever we did the round tables uh, for off the glass on rookie of the year. So I'm not going to back off of my pick, even though, in the, you know, the recent weeks, I've been paying more attention to Ben Simmons and watching him dominate. Obviously, the Sixers have been fantastic post-All-Star break. Uh, and even with MB, they are, you know, they haven't lost much steam. They're still playing as a team. Ben Simmons last night had another triple-double. Uh, he's been fantastic. For me, I, I guess what Donovan Mitchell, to me, just catches my eye more is the fact that he had for so long, you know, with Rudy Gobert being hurt, he had to really carry the load for this Utah Jazz team. Um, obviously, they were still below 500 before Rudy Gobert came back. But without Donovan Mitchell, that team is probably, you know, a part of the tankathon, and they're probably playing for a high lottery pick, whereas Mitchell was able to keep them afloat. And then with Rudy Gobert coming back, we now see them as the, currently the four seed, and they have the possibility of getting home court. Um, I, I think Mitchell, you know, in his first year, uh, offensively had to take a huge load on his shoulders. He had to be the number one option for an offense. Um, obviously, Ben Simmons is the point guard for that Sixers team, and he's had to do a lot. But something that I always take into, you know, to put some stock in is the fact that, you know, Ben Simmons was drafted last year. And even though he got hurt, he still got an extra year around NBA scouts where at, or NBA trainers and everything else. Whereas Donovan Mitchell is pretty much doing this still in his rookie season. You know, I don't know how much you can really put into that of how much that really matters. Um, I just think uh, Donovan Mitchell has been more important important to his team as a rookie than Ben Simmons. I think, you know, for the fact is, if you want to mention, you know, he did have a year in the NBA, I, you can't really hold it against Ben Simmons unless they change the rule because it's not really his fault he was injured and missed the whole season. No, so of course. I, I'm not saying it's – I don't want to say it's his fault. I'm just saying, like, it, for me, it's something that, like, it. I take that into account when I'm voting. Yeah, I mean, I understand that point. If you want to go with that road, that makes sense. But I think overall, like Jonathan mentioned, Ben Simmons is the best rookie this season. His impact on both ends of the floor, like you mentioned, without Embiid, they're on a five-game winning streak. And, you know, they're on-off numbers. Mitchell's plus 6.2. Simmons is eight uh, plus 8.8. .8, as well as true shooting percentage. I know everybody talks about, like, oh, you know, Simmons can't shoot. He doesn't shoot threes. He doesn't shoot free throws. True shooting percentage takes into account free throws and three-pointers and kind of makes that have more value. Simmons is still shooting the higher percentage as well. You know, Mitchell did keep them afloat, but they were still 11 and 15 without Rudy Gobert. So it's not like Rudy Gobert wasn't ridiculous with that team and he came back. I think they're 35 and 18 with him. So he did, you know, shelt, uh, you know, hold the offensive load. But as again, Ben Simmons is kind of that quarterback in Philly. He's running the show, setting everybody up. Everybody's having a pretty good season. He's doing it very efficiently and quietly almost averaging a triple-double. I would say Mitchell is maybe the more surprising rookie because Ben Simmons was my pick for rookie of the year going into it. But, you know, Ben Simmons is the best rookie this season. 
You know, I'm, I'm just going to throw another uh, little, since you're talking about some of the advanced stats uh, there, I'm just going to throw another one out, and that's win share. So for anyone listening who doesn't know what win shares uh, really are, it's essentially a, a statistic that tries to divvy up, you know, uh, how much credit each player should get for uh, a win. So the Utah Jazz have about, I think it's 46 wins on the season. Uh, Philly are at 49. But Donovan Mitchell's win shares are at 4.8 for the season, like his cumulative win shares. And Ben Simmons is at nine. He's got double the win shares, which means he's carrying almost double the load or he takes almost double the credit for his team's wins than Donovan Mitchell. And and the other side of that is, you know, you've got to talk about the maturity of Ben Simmons. I know, you know, he doesn't shoot threes and he's not a particularly good free throw shooter, but we don't hold that against players like Shaq. We don't hold that against players like, Tim Duncan and the reason for that is because they play within their strengths and that's what Ben Simmons does you don't see him taking you know threes you don't see him trying to force anything from the perimeter he knows what he's good at and he sticks to it he gets to the basket he puts a shoulder down and he finishes around the rim and he does it very well for a rookie and I just think that the maturity to be able to make those decisions coupled with the load that he's you know as a first year player he was essentially made the de facto point guard at six foot ten He's done a great job, and I, I just think that he de- deserves a lot of credit for those uh, intangibles that he's brought this year. He's also, I think, a huge mismatch offensively. Where you look at, you have this six uh, six ten guy. You're throwing at point guard. He can play all over the floor. You know, many teams don't have guys that are quick enough to stay in front of him and as well contest them at the rim. So he's definitely a mismatch. And then on the other end of the floor, defensively, he's able to match up with point guards to power forwards with his size and quickness. Or I think Donovan Mitchell, yeah, he's definitely huge offensively, and he's a three-level scorer. And, you know, Simmons might ever never be able to score the way that Mitchell does, but his overall impact for Simmons in terms of passing, rebounding, defending, and being that mismatch, and like Jonathan mentioned, the intangibles, I think it's just huge. And Simmons, like, last night, and you know, it's kind of like, the candle on the cake for Simmons last night, having a matchup like he did against LeBron James and holding his own, you know, obviously he didn't outplay LeBron, but there were situations where he went straight at LeBron and he won those situations. And I'm not saying he's better than LeBron right now, but that type of mentality and just, you know, when I think every, all three of us, when we see Ben Simmons, we see a potential top five player in the NBA moving forward. I don't know if I see that with Donovan Mitchell. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely, I definitely agree that the, the ceiling and I mean, all right, let me reword that. Uh, ben Simmons, I think, without question, is going to be a superstar in this league. I mean, he's already been crowned the next LeBron James. Uh, obviously, Le- yeah, LeBron's pretty much fallen in love with Ben Simmons, which is, you know, obviously uh, starting more LeBron to Philly debates, which is a different story. But, you know, LeBron sees a lot of himself in Ben Simmons. Ben Simmons obviously has the higher ceiling, I think. Donovan Mitchell, to me, is kind of like a – I mean, it's funny. If you were to compare them to two guys, like I would see Donovan Mitchell as more of like a Kobe kind of guy with the fact where he he pretty much goes out there and scores. He's shooting – he's taking 17.4 shots per game this year. And then Ben Simmons is the all-around, you know, I'm going to facilitate, I'm going to rebound, and I'm going to score when it suits me, but I'm really not about, you know, trying to score 30-plus points a night. Um, I mean, who knows? I have a question for you guys. Maybe this is another year where we see co-rookie of the years. I, I don't think so. I would kind of be upset for Ben Simmons because I think like his season is so his, historical. Triple double wise too, he's second all time in rookie triple doubles. Like I know triple doubles aren't as big as they once were, but just the fact and he's done it so efficiently, like three point four turnovers isn't even that bad, and he's consistently running the show, and his decision making is just so on point. Where I think like you mentioned, another thing I would throw at Mitchell is his efficiency isn't necessarily great. You know, his shooting numbers aren't crazy. Obviously, he has to shoot more, and there's not a ton of offensive weapons, but still. I just think Simmons has to be rookie of the year by himself. It would just, it, I would think it would be disrespectful if he didn't win, to be honest. Yeah, yeah that's think, nothing I against think, Mitchell either. I think he's an outstanding player. He would win rookie of the year any other season. But when you have an all time, you know, possibly an all time great player, Ben Simmons, I know I'm getting ahead of myself. I think he has to win rookie of the year. Yeah, I think co rookie of the year, co MVP, co all the talk about the co awards, I think it kind of cheapens the award. And, and I think it, it, uh, it, it, it kind of takes away from what the the award stands for. But I, I have a question for you, Corey, and, and, and I, I, I kind of just want to make a point with this question. But if you were a GM and you were picking from this this year's draft class one guy to take going forward, who would you take based off of what you've seen this year? Well, this draft class doesn't have Ben Simmons. You know that, right? Or Sorry, I, I meant sorry this class of rookies, like this uh, this year's class of rookies. I mean, if it's this year's class of rookies, then it's out. It's Ben Simmons. 
Well, I'll even make it a little bit better, the question. If you were to pick a player right now for you have for the whole season, not in terms of moving forward, what player would you want on your team moving into the playoffs right now? Ben Simmons or Donovan Mitchell? Who's going to have more an impact for your team? Ben Simmons. I mean, without without question, Ben Simmons is obviously the better player and the guy you want on your team. I just think I just think his impact on the floor has been less than that of a Donovan Mitchell. If you're going by the overall body of work and the the stats, the triple doubles, uh, I think Ben Simmons is the landslide, and he he is going to win MVP, and he should win MVP. But for me personally, because I, I always view reward awards differently, so I, even MVP, I view that as like you know the significance that you have to your team, not necessarily are you the best player. Um, which obviously we'll talk about down the road, but uh, it's got to be Ben Simmons. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of people, and I think Donovan Mitchell will get some rookie of the year votes for sure, but I'm pretty confident I think Ben Simmons should win, and he probably will win. And it kind of makes up for last year when uh, Joel Embiid obviously didn't get it because of injury. And then I even thought Dario Sarr, but that's for another day. To our next award, six man of the year. Who is winning six man of the year? Well, for me, I've got the I've got, in my opinion, the greatest six man of all time, <laughs> and that's Lou Williams. Um, Drake agrees. Drake, I, hey, hey, and I've I've got the Canadian connection, so I I, I got to <laughs> represent, right? Uh, uh, I I uh, there's no doubt in my mind he deserves to be six man of the year this year. Uh, he's he's been absolutely incredible. Um, he's I, I in my opinion he's not just been the Clippers best player off the bench he has been their best player period which is you know for a sixth man that it's it's you know kind unbelievable <laughs> yeah it's 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 unbelievable that your best player is coming off the bench but i think in the the clippers uh situation that's the case uh you know averaging 22 and a half points per game you know that's almost unheard of and his playmaking has improved this year he's been a, a almost like the de facto point guard for that team but based off of how many you know injuries they've had at that at that position so yeah, I'm taking Lou Williams absolutely I, I think it's a lock yeah I also pick Lou Williams um I mean really I think I I really got on the Lou Williams bandwagon this season when he dropped 50 on the Warriors head <laughs> that, that was a tremendous performance obviously uh he's been great uh, I mean without him um I don't know where this Clippers team would be at he's been the majority of their offense obviously uh Blake Griffin being traded away, this team I thought was going to go down into, you know, start tanking, probably become a lottery team, and that didn't happen. It's mainly because Lou Williams, you know, he's averaging career highs, he's instant offense, and he's a six man. You know, this, isn't, this isn't a guy that comes, you know, that starts the game and gives you, you know, 20 plus points. It's the guy who comes off the bench and gives it to you. Uh, he's been tremendous. It's funny, it's not funny, but, like, you know, you think about a couple of years ago, he had that Achilles injury. And those injuries can either be, you know, make or break for a career, and it hasn't really slowed up Lou Williams. If anything, he's been one of the few guys who's gotten better after having an Achilles injury. Yeah, he really adapted his game and kept working on it. And I agree, Lou Williams is a lock. It's just, this is a word I didn't even write anything down for because I knew that we'd all agree. Like Jonathan mentioned, the fact that he's probably been their best player coming off the bench has been crazy. He's really stepped up for injuries. Like Corey mentioned, that 50-point game against the Warriors. Then also he had that stretch, I think, in early 2018 where he just went off and nobody could really defend him. So shout out to Lou Will for getting better in his at age 31. Yeah, I had him in a fantasy basketball, which I won this year. And uh, it was, I got him like, you know, late in the draft too, because I don't think anyone expected him to be this good. So Lou Williams, thank you for winning me a title. Yep, shout out to him. So another six man award. Um, obviously, since we kind of all locked him in, anybody else deserves some consideration? You know, they're not going to win, but who else do you think deserves maybe a second or third place vote or something like that? Um, I, 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 I he, he's definitely not going to win, but I think somebody who deserves just a little bit of, uh, of a shout out is uh, Fred Van Vliet from the Toronto Raptors. Yeah. If I feel like I feel like if I don't bring him up, no one will. And 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 he really has been uh, a great player off the bench for the Raptors this year. And considering they have, you know, arguably the best bench in the NBA right now, I think he deserves a lot of credit. Uh, you know, eight points, two rebounds, and three assists is not going to blow anybody away. But if you actually watch the Raptors consistently and you see the big shots that this guy makes, the big plays that he makes at the end of games, and then you look at the fact that the Raptors just won their fifty seventh win, their their franchise record win. I, I think he deserves a lot of credit. I think he might get a few votes. I, I, I doubt he'll get any first place votes, but I just think he deserves a little bit of credit. For sure. Honestly, I've watched a good amount of Toronto. He's a pesky defender. He's going to, I've mentioned this on Twitter before. He's really going to annoy the shit out of somebody for a seven game series. And like you mentioned, he's had some big moments in the fourth quarter. They close games with him sometimes. Like he's just, he's really improved in an undrafted guy putting in work like that. It's always nice to see. 
Yeah, and if you if you watch the the Raptors and Celtics game from uh, their, their most recent game at their Canada Center, uh, there's even lineups where the Raptors will play three point guards. They'll play yep. uh, Van Van Vliet, Lowry, and and Delon Wright, and it's Van Vliet that handles the ball. It's not Lowry. They like they rather have Lowry come off uh, and play a little bit off the ball. But he's he's severely underrated, and I I think the Raptors are going to do a lot more with him going forward. Yeah, I think he def, Ben Lee definitely deserves uh, some kind of shining credit for how he's been this year. Especially because, I mean, the Raptors bench in general, those guys have produced way over the ceiling that anyone, pro, you know, projected for any of those guys. Um, for me, I guess the only other person, too, besides Ben Lee, I guess like Eric Gordon, he probably deserves like a little shine because, you know, he's always consistent. He's always that, you know, three-point shooter off the bench. I mean, he had a really hot start. I know he's come, you know, more back down to earth because Chris Paul obviously came back and, uh, his minutes had gotten a little bit shorter, but uh, he's probably the only other guy I can think of. I'm a yeah. little sour on Eric Gordon because I think he stole sixth man of the year from Lou Williams last season, to be honest. So I'm a little that sour tra- on him. <laughs> I think that trade uh, to Houston last year kind of hurt Lou Will's campaign. Uh, I've, I've noticed some people also mentioned like David West as a guy who's kind of stepped for, for Golden State a little bit this year. So, I mean, there are always some guys, but Lou Will is definitely the winner for sure. On to Defensive Player of the Year. Who are we rolling with for the best defensive player this season? Well, I, I went with uh, I went with my pick because I, I genuinely think he's the best defensive force in the league right now. Uh, it, it's it's it was tough because a lot of players had great seasons. Uh, you know, a couple guys that deserve a shout out are Rudy Gobert and Paul George, but I think that Anthony Davis, without a doubt, is the absolute best defensive force in the NBA. He is an absolute wrecking ball at the, the rim he can come out and guard smaller guards he he essentially does it all and and i think that he doesn't get a lot of credit for his defense you know a lot of superstars when they're when they're you know Kawhi Leonard's an exception but a lot of superstars don't get the, the credit they deserve uh for their ability to play on both ends but anthony davis has just been a monster on the defensive end this season and you know when you compare him you know stat for stat play for play you you know you can't you can compare him to anybody in the league and he's going to come out on top in my opinion so Anthony Davis obviously is in the conversation. I was really torn between Anthony Davis and the guy I picked, which is Rudy Gobert. Um, obviously, Rudy Gobert is known for his defense. He's known for the the monster blocks. Um, I'm not a huge stat guy, but I, I do have a few stats on Rudy Gobert. He currently leads the NBA in defensive real plus minus. When he is off the floor, the Jazz have 105.4 defensive rating. When he is on the floor, it is 97.9. That is the best defensive rating among all players and even all teams in the NBA currently. Uh, obviously, the Jazz were below 500 without him. And once he has returned, they are now looking at home court advantage currently in the Western Conference. Obviously, one win or one loss completely changes all of that. But um, he's been great, and I just think his impact – on the floor, I mentioned this on uh, Players Watch the other day with Evan. It kind of reminds me of like Roy Hibbert when he was like in his prime. You know, when you knew you were going up against that elite rim protector, it completely changed the complexion of the game. You know, you don't see guys want to drive to the paint as much, and they know Rudy Gobert is out there. Teams scheme to try and pull him out of the paint more. Uh, I, I just think Gofer- Gobert currently is uh, the best defensive center in the game. Yeah, I, I agree with the fact that I think Anthony Davis is probably has more def- defensive capabilities, but this year Rudy Gobert has been the more impactful defender. So he's Defensive Player of the Year for me, like you mentioned, Corey. All, the fact that you can hold it, you know, your defensive rating is under 100 in the NBA the way it is nowadays with the pace and the three-point shots is kind of ridiculous. And they kind of funnel everybody to Gobert in that Utah Jazz defense. And they're like, all right, try to make a shot over him in the paint. It's incredibly difficult. There's only, you know, I think there's only like two or three guys that have similar uh, standing reaches in length and wingspan compared to him. And that's like Giannis Antetokounmpo and Jared Allen. So not many guys can really compete with him in terms of length. Also, like I mentioned, talking Donovan Mitchell, they're 35 and 18 with Gobert, 11 and 15 without him. Obviously, he has an impact offensively, but the majority of his impact comes on the defensive end. So I think his overall impact is just showed so much by him missing time. And Anthony Davis, like I agree, John, he's one of the most capable defensive players. I think sometimes my problem with him with him is it's just like the consistency defensively in the effort. Because I think at some points in the season, especially earlier on when Demarcus Cousins out was uh, wasn't out. He wasn't putting in the same amount of effort in right now. And some of that's not even on him because they asked him to do a lot offensively. But I think Gobert's defensive impact has been bigger this season. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree 
or sorry, I couldn't disagree more with you guys. I, I'm not giving an end of the season award to somebody who's played 53, 54, 55 games. Uh, in my opinion, he shouldn't even be eligible for the award. Well, if you uh, want to go with that, if you want to go with that argument, I think that's fine. But if you're looking at them both in terms of the season they've had, I think like Gobert's defensive impact. If you want to say he didn't play enough games, I think that's fair because you know he didn't even play 60. So that that does hurt his case. But if we're not, you know, in in um, counting games and things like that, I think Gobert's the defensive player of the year. Well, I, I, have a, I, sorry, sorry, I, I have a question for you, John. So last year for rookie of the year, you were all in on Brogdon because Embiid only played 36 games. Uh, I was kind of I was kind of split on that one because Embiid was so much better than the field that it, like it was and that was the kind of a special case because there was really you know if you're comparing Malcolm Brogdon to Joel Embiid you know there there's there was no comparison he was so much better than Malcolm Brogdon so I was kind of split on that one but in this situation when you have guys that and, and I mean we can split hairs over who has the more like the biggest impact statistically it, it's extremely close and and. You know, we can go back and forth on it, but when they're that close and one guy is only there for half the season, I don't think it's really fair to the, the other guy who's, you know, there night in and night out or close to it, you know, and, and also when you consider the fact that he has to carry the load offensively as well. So it's, it's uh, you know, it, it, it's for me, it's, it's, it's close. Absolutely. I think, I think Gobert is, you know, arguably uh, the best rim protector that we've had in the NBA in, in quite some time since maybe, Dwight Howard's heyday, but um, I think Anthony Davis is more uh, versatile. I think some of the stuff that he does doesn't show up on the, you know, the stat sheet, like his ability to switch out on guards. And I think that, you know, his defense has resulted in more wins for the Pelicans than Gobert's defense has resulted in wins for the Jazz, just based on the fact that Gobert hasn't played enough games. I mean, but think about it this way. I, I disagree with that because look at the Jazz. When Gobert was out, they were three games under 500. He comes back and what are they, 12 or 13 games over 500, possibly being a top four seed. So his impact is felt completely and it's mostly on the defensive end. Where Anthony Davis, like you said, he's putting in a ton offensively. Like he has, he's going to be in the MVP conversation. He's not going to win, but it's because of, you know, his impact all over the floor. I think defensively Gobert sticks out a little bit more because he's not having quite the same impact, obviously, as Anthony Davis does offensively because Davis is doing everything. He's attacking the three point line. He's working you in post ups. He's working off the dribble, the pick and roll, offensive rebounding, tip ins, dunks, all types of stuff. Where Gobert, pick and roll player offensively, getting tip ins, you know, being that big guy, catching oops in the paint, where Anthony Davis is doing a ton and his impact is felt all over the place. And that's impacting on more wins. Where Gobert's impact is mostly just on defense and that's changing them from being uh, borderline. Well, I, their comparison in terms of win percentage, if they didn't have Gobert when they're 11 and 15, is around like 42% win wise. And that would put them around the same thing as the Lakers or the Charlotte Hornets. So they go from being you know, out of the playoffs to being possibly a top four seed in the West with Gobert. So in all of his impact, is, we, I think we'd all agree that Gobert's impact is mostly on defensive end than offensive. I, I agree, agree with I, I, I agree with that. But what I'm saying is that throughout the, the entire season, sorry, I didn't mean to say that, you know, Davis is producing more or more wins with his defense strictly because he's a better defender. I mean that because he's been around all season, he's only missed 10 games, which I think this, this that must be some kind of record for Anthony Davis, but <laughs> shout um, <out> to him. <laughs> yeah, it's shout out for staying healthy. But um, I think that because he was there for 72 games, his nightly defense, I mean, it's hard to argue that he has produced more wins defensively than Rudy Gobert strictly based on the fact that he was there for more games you know he was he was there for uh you know 20 something more games and and I, I just I I can't give Gobert the credit as he has been the best defender all year if he only had to do it in half the number of games you know if when you go out there every single night and you produce at an elite level you deserve credit for that, and if you if you're sitting on the bench, and not not that not that Rudy Gobert was like being lazy and sitting on the bench and taking games off, but when you're on the bench, you're a hinder, you're a hindrance to your team, and you're not on the floor helping your team. So though he shouldn't get votes for what he wasn't able to do, he shouldn't get votes for you know the ab the, the absence of elite play. Anthony Davis should get votes for being there night in and night out. Well, I'll ask you this. So hypothetically, let's just assume that Rudy Gobert played 65 or 70 games somewhat close to Anthony Davis. Would you agree that Gobert is Defensive Player of the Year then? If his numbers were all exactly the same, 
Yes, but I have a feeling that maybe Gobert's numbers would be a little different if he was playing on a nightly basis. You know, the sm smaller number of games potentially could have an impact on, or help. you know. Sure, like, I mean, it just, just it, it could help if it's, his numbers are the same, right? That's what I'm saying. So if, if, if the impact that he had in the 50 games that he played, if that were to carry over to the rest of the season, absolutely. But I have a feeling that being out there night in and night out and not playing a shorter season, you're not going to be as consistent on the defensive end. It's just a fact of life. And I, I, I think I, we, I would want to see the whole season. But I, I will say this. If, if he played the full season and produced the way he produced in the 50 or so games, uh, yeah, definitely. He'd well, I, wouldn't, I won't say definitely, but yeah, he'd probably be my defensive player of the year. But as it stands, based off of the facts, based off what I saw this year, Anthony Davis is the defensive player of the year, and I think he deserves that award. Uh, that award. What do you think about the fact – I know I, I haven't, don't know it off the top of my head, but I know Gobert was – I don't know if you like NBA math or not, but that's a great website in terms of advanced statistics. I know he was up there top five in terms of defensive points saved, and he hasn't even played, you know, the same amount of games as all these guys. So I think the point saved defensively still has an impact, but I think it's like apples and oranges in terms of comparison. You're holding it against him for the games, which is fair. And Corey and I just kind of don't care about the games because we can see the impact otherwise. So, but moving on to most improved player, who do you guys have? Well, I think, uh, I think this Corey's going to, yeah, yeah, I'm just right waiting. Now. I'm sitting here like about to bounce <laughs> through the mic. Like I have my, like I didn't have anything else to add to the last debate. But you know, I'm sitting here, so you guys just go ahead. Tell me who you got, and I'll either hang up or stay in here. Just let me know. <laughs> well, I was gonna say I think I think Corey's gonna like my uh, my pick on this one. So uh, my uh, most improved player of the year is Victor Oladipo. I think uh, he has completely transformed the way people think of him or the way people view of him, and uh, he did it in 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 one year. So mm -hmm. I, I think. You know, anytime a player posts, uh, you know, career highs in points, assists, rebounds, steals, blocks, field goals, three point percent. That's almost the entire stat line. Keep going, thank you. Keep that's, going. The, that's almost the entire stat line. He's not only the most improved player of the year; he is a candidate for MVP this season. That is no joke. This guy deserves to be in that conversation, whether he's at the top of the heap or you know, for a little further down the ladder. This guy has been an absolute star this season. Thank you. I I can hear the crowd already roaring in the background, giving you a standing <laughs> ovation and at Baker Field Life. Um, yeah, I, I'm right there with Victor Oladipo too. Uh, obviously, he's been tremendous. He's like like John mentioned, every single statistical uh, category, major category, he's raised his his numbers in. Um, he's become the you know the face of the franchise in less than a year. He's completely changed Indiana. Um, I know earlier on in the year, he's done a lot of things off the court too, which has, you know, they, they don't translate obviously on the floor. But for example, early in the season, Miles Turner was going through a really cold patch of the season. He was struggling. And uh, Victor Oladipo called him up one night at 1 a.m. And they had like a 15 minute conversation. And Victor Oladipo said, This isn't for over the phone. I'm going to come over. And Victor Oladipo came over to like Miles Turner's house at like 1 15 in the morning and they hung out for like two hours and just talked basketball and went over things. You know, that's that's a leader move from a guy who wasn't even in, you know, wasn't even in Indiana for more than six months at the time. Um, so I think he's completely changed uh, as a player on the field on the court, as a leader in the locker room. He's completely flipped the script. And you mentioned MVP. You know, I don't think he's in the top five, but he definitely deserves to be in the top ten maybe near the top five in the conversation because of the complete impact he's had on the floor. Uh, he's had 63 straight games with a steal. I've never seen that in the history of me watching professional basketball. I've never seen a guy record a steal in 63 straight games. What, and did he just pass Gary Payton or tied him or something? He, right? he just tied Gary Payton for fifth all time, yeah. And uh, he's actually had a streak, too, of 84 straight games with either a steal or a block. So this streak in general is ridiculous. Yeah, like you guys mentioned, there's not really much more to say. The improvements in the box score statistics, the advanced statistics, just a lot of things. And like Corey mentioned, as a team leader, also he's been huge in the clutch. I know Corey knows this. He's hit a ton of big shots where he needed down the stretch. He's also just like the fact that you go from being a starter and maybe even a borderline starter where people were kind of upset with him in OKC in a sense and going to Indiana and becoming a star player is huge. And Corey, like you mentioned in your article you wrote about Oladipo a few weeks ago, which was great. Check it out on OTGBasketball.com. The Pacers haven't won a game without Oladipo. I think they've lost, what, seven games with, when he hasn't played, and they yeah. haven't won one. Yeah, they've so. lost every game, and I believe of those seven or eight games they've lost, six of them, I believe, have been by double digits. 
that's a big impact. Like Jonathan said, he's not probably going to win MVP, but the impact he's had, he's definitely the MVP of the Pacers, and he's at least a candidate for the award. Very impressive season. And it's very rare you see a player make that much improvement in one off season. You know, it's just a really big jump. I, it kind of reminds me of that year where Jimmy Butler just went from being like a starter on the Bulls to becoming one of their star players. I love that everyone agreed on Victor Oladipo, the, the nice consensus. I believe, too, in the the round table, it was unanimous as well with Which Victor Oladipo being most improved. Yeah, no, it really is. So um, I'm sure someone else will get a most improved. I have a question for you guys. Who would be runner-up in most improved if you had to pick someone? This is honestly a very – I mean, Clint Capella is a guy I think you think about. Obviously, a lot of his improvement, though, comes from Chris Paul and James Harden. Uh, Aaron Gordon and the Magic weren't so bad. Porzingis was a guy I definitely was thinking about for the war, and I think if the Knicks were able to kind of make that playoff run possibly or even compete for that eighth seed, he would at least gave Oladipo a little bit of a race. And then Spencer Dinwiddie had some nice moments in terms of most improved, but he definitely cooled off later in the season. So I think, like, the runner-ups just really aren't there. Like, a lot of them cooled off or got injured. Yeah, I had I had Jalen Brown at the you know beginning of the year after watching him play for a few like I think my my, my original pick was Yosef Nurkic who uh, pretty much stayed the same player as he was <laughs> uh, last season. But um, uh, Jalen Brown after you know the first fifteen or so games that that streak early on by Boston really impressed me and I thought he was gunning towards that position and then Victor Oladipo just absolutely annihilated everybody else that was in running. Uh, like you said. Spencer Dinwiddie deserves a little bit of credit there. Brandon Ingram's another guy I think that uh, you know injuries kind of hurt him too. Yeah, but he you know he really deserves to be uh, acknowledged. Chris Dunn was you know a completely different player this season before he went down with injuries, and and, and maybe even Giannis. You know Giannis, we we kind of forget about the the, the hot star, star players. Yeah, he 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 was he was really good this season. His team kind of faltered towards the uh, you know the All Star break, but. You know, he he was really good beginning of the season. He he had a really great season, but uh, yeah, I think Victor Oladipo is uh, far and away uh, the best candidate. This is a little off topic, but the Bucks need a better roster for Giannis. Like they, the roster just doesn't necessarily fit his style of play. You know, completely, they just need more shooters, guys to spread the floor that kind of fit his role. But that's for another day. I'm glad we all agree agree on most improved a exec, executive of the year. It's I picked I picked Kevin Pritchard in the round table, but I I don't I don't I just picked him out of the pure fact. Well, yeah, you know everyone in the round table pretty much played Daryl Morey um, or Danny Ainge, which I think those two are guys at the front runners. I pretty much just gave Kevin Pritchard some shine because obviously the Pacers are summers in the Eastern Conference and no one thought they would be. Um, and even, you know, the Sabonis and Old Depot trade, obviously everyone thought that was a bad trade. And if that trade had gone bad, the Pacers probably would be in deep trouble. But he's made, like, a lot of smaller moves, too, that I really liked. You know, adding Corey Joseph, who I know, um, Jonathan, you've seen a lot in Toronto. He's just a gritty guy. He, he's a perfect backup point guard, I think. You know, adding Darren Collison, uh, getting Trevor Booker off the waiver wire. Just a lot of things Karen Pitcher done. has been a solid signing, even as much as he <laughs> pissed me off in the past. He's been good for the Pacers. He's uh, – the Pacers, I believe, are – oh, damn, I saw a stat last night. I don't want to botch it. But they're like they're like 12-2 and two when he scores over 20 points. Like when he's on, they're extremely good. Sounds um, about right. Yeah, and when they beat the Warriors the other night, he had uh, – he matched Durant. Durant, I believe, had – uh, 27 or 29 points, and Bogdanovich had 20, 28, I believe. So, you know, when you're when you're having two of the best small forwards in the game go head to head, you know what what, <laughs> what else can you hope for? Um, oh but I God. think he I definitely deserves. The, I gotta end the show now. No, <laughs> <laughs> he definitely deserves some props. I think Kevin Pritchard, but I think executive of the year has to be Daryl Morey. Uh, you get Chris Paul to add next to your already superstar, and then you bring in you know PJ Tucker. Uh, you retain guys like uh, Nene, who obviously hasn't been, you know, fantastic, but he's still a part of that team. Um, Eric Gordon, it, the the entire roster they put together in Houston is built for this current age of basketball, and I think Daryl Morey's uh, probably executive of the year. Ah, I disagree, man. I'm sorry. Like I, I, I think he's he he had a good off season, and I think the Rockets are are now a legitimate title contender. But I think the Chris Paul trade was a, a little bit more of Player on player, uh, James Harden worked that shooting. trade. Yeah, yeah, and and you have to remember, Chris Paul went to the Clippers and said, "Look, I'm either going to be a free agent, or you can trade me to the Rockets, and um, you know, get something back in return." 
he he wanted to go. He was already out on the Clippers. I don't know how much influence Daryl Morey had on that trade. And then there was a lot of internal growth with a lot of the players that they already had. They signed a few nice perimeter ple- uh, pieces um, like uh, P.J. Tucker. But again, I don't know how much of that was was uh, Daryl Morey. I, I mean, if we just take a second to look at the offseason that Danny Ainge had for the Celtics and look at everything that he pulled off, I don't think there's much of an argument against him. I mean, the, for, you know, for starters, he drafted Jason Tatum in that draft, and everybody kind of thought, what are the Celtics doing? They traded the first pick for the third pick, and then maybe a pick that they're going to get next season. And everybody kind of just went, what are they doing? But in doing that, he got the guy he wanted, who's arguably the most talented guy in the draft. They also got, a, you know, they also opened the opportunity to get another first round pick next season. They also managed to fleece, completely fleece the Cleveland Cavaliers in taking Kyrie Irving for what was left of Isaiah Thomas and uh, Jay Crowder. And we saw what happened uh, with those guys in Cleveland. It completely blew up and it couldn't have worked out any better for uh, the Boston Celtics. Then on top of that, you know, nice little rotation pieces that they added in Marcus Morris, uh, Greg Monroe. He, he had an absolute – oh, and don't, oh, I'm completely forgetting the fact that he was, the man, he, man, he was the man who brought Gordon Hayward. Now, forget about the fact that he broke his ankle but or dislocated his ankle, but he brought Gordon Hayward. On top of all that, he brought that guy to the team, uh, especially considering the market for him was, uh, was deep. There was a lot of people after his services. Boston won that out after uh, wooing him over the, the offseason, and he still – managed to maintain enough draft pieces and enough uh, rotation pieces so that if a guy like Kawhi Leonard, per se, comes available, <clears throat> they have the pieces <laughs> to pull him in and add him to the collection of talent that they already have. I think, you know, for me, the fact that he was able to pull off all of that in one season is phenomenal. And, you know, <laughs> Donovan Mitchell is great. Ben Simmons is going to be a superstar. But Jason Tatum can play basketball. That guy is unbelievable. And the the fact that they picked him third, uh, it just shows how smart of a, uh, of a of a talent scout Danny Ainge and his team are. Uh, I, I agree. Honestly, this is a, a very tough executive of the year because it's kind of like a possibility where this could be like a co-award because I see both sides of the situation where in a sense where Danny Ainge had an incredible offseason – but it really hasn't come to fruition in the sense where, you know, Boston's a lot better than they were last season. On terms of paper, you know, Kyrie Irving, Gordon Hayward, like you mentioned, the Jason Tatum trade, and even the trade you didn't mention, Avery Bradley for uh, for Morris did have an impact on the team because Bradley hasn't been great in Detroit as well and now in L.A. So I think uh, it's tough. But the fact that Maury put together a team that can compete with Golden State after we thought that Golden State was a lock to win a finals for like the next few seasons. And I'm not here to say Houston's going to beat them in a seven game series, but I think we'd all agree that Houston has a shot to beat Golden State in a series. And, you know, I know James Harden had a big impact on Chris Paul making the trade, but the fact that Daryl Morey kept the cap available, had the flexibility in his roster, and that's been something he's had for the last few seasons. Houston's been involved in a lot of trades. There's possible signings for big name free agents because he's done a great job with the flexibility. So it's kind of like an award for him that he's been working on for a few years and it kind of just came the fruitation this year in terms of they're a real threat to the Warriors where so Boston it didn't work out and it's mostly because of injuries but they're not a threat to Golden State this season see my argument against that would be that the executive award it's a little different from the other awards in that you're not just judging them on what they are accomplished you know what they've done for this year only you, you know because as an executive it's their job to kind of look into the future as well and I think what he's been able to do for Boston's future I mean how sure are you that uh, Chris Paul is going to stay in Houston I'm sure it's I'm sure it's a good chance but if LeBron gets on the phone with him and says hey you guys like I mean let's say you know for argument's sake let's say they 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 don't go to the finals they they lose to Golden State in five or six games Who's to say that LeBron doesn't get on the phone with Chris Paul this offseason and say, hey, man, I'm going to Philly. Uh, you know, we could use your help if you want to come to Philly. Or, hey, I'm going to San Antonio. If you want to come to San Antonio, we could use your help in San Antonio. I think Chris Paul jumps at that. So I, but, I think uh, – I'll throw I another think, hypothetical at you. He traded for Kyrie Irving. Hypothetically, I'm not trying to wish bad things on Kyrie, but there's a possibility his knee's an issue for the rest of his career. There, Well, but th- I mean – It's just okay. as much as a hy- hypothetical as Chris Paul leaving next season. It's, the, the, it's a possibility, but the difference is Gordon Hayward, though. It, like, there's an and Kyrie already had the injury history. 
So it's not like it's a perfect trade. And then I think you have to throw in the fact Danny Ainge was able to make that trade from previous moves he's had. If he doesn't get that blessing from Billy King and the Nets and having all those first round picks, he's not able to make the move from Kyrie. So if you want to, hey man, hey man, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> I'm just saying you have to include you have to include the past too. Like that's what I'm saying about Daryl Morey. He set up this team over years to get to be able to make the moves they have and put this roster together. So did Danny Ainge. That's what I'm saying. But his his he came the fruitation. It's executive of the year not for executive of the future years because there's still plenty of hypotheticals. The Celtics could possibly never win a championship. Same thing could say, but I think right now we'd all agree that this year Houston has the best chance at beating Golden State if healthy. Well, and I think too, just some that, and you know, with every win Houston has, you know, gained the last two weeks, it's a franchise record. Every win from here on out to end the season is a franchise record and wins. They've never had this many wins in a season. So I think that's something to take into account too, right? This has been the most successful team in Houston Rockets history, regular season history. Yeah, and I'm not taking anything away, but I think it's kind of still like executive of this year in the sense that you have to show me something that happened. Like it's the same thing you mentioned. It's like kind of the opposite argument of what you're saying for Gobert and Anthony Davis. Like if you want to see it happen, it has to happen. Like hypothetically, you know, all the moves could look great right now. Let's talk about a move that looked great in the summer, and that's Paul George for Victor Oladipo and Sabonis. It didn't turn out that way going forward. So the moves haven't really come to fruition yet. You know, if they come to fruition next year, and you can kind of add it to his case in the sense that, all right, the Celtics are the best team in the East, and they have a chance of winning a championship, it's going to have an impact, and he'll could win next year. But I think the fact that the Celtics aren't so much better than last season, that it's kind of hard to give him the award. I, I don't know, man. I, I don't know. I, I, I think it's I think it's kind of easy to see what they've been able to accomplish. I, I think that the Celtics are a lot better than they were last season, uh, believe it or not. I, I don't think that, that – Do you think you know, they're going to go farther this season than last year? Well, I don't, but I think that the field has caught up to them. I don't think it's so much that, um, that Boston has gotten worse. I think it's everybody else has gotten better. I mean, Toronto's a much better team than they were last season. And, and to be honest, I don't think Bo- – I think Boston were lucky to get to uh, where they were last season. Cleveland kind of, you know, struggled in the regular season, so they didn't – take that first seed and then Boston was able to avoid Toronto in the second round because I think that was a series that that uh that Boston would have lost but I mean I'm, I'm getting off topic I, I think I genuinely think that this Boston Celtics team uh, before Kyrie went down was significantly better than where they were last year and uh, I think genuinely I genuinely think that the moves Danny Ainge made were more impressive than the moves Daryl Morey made I mean I think he built on some existing talent. I mean, James Harden was already a complete superstar. Boston didn't have a superstar. Now they have, you know, two potential, three, maybe even three potential superstars. I, I think we're throwing around the word superstar a little bit too much. Do you think? Do you think, Kyrie, do you think? Do you think Kyrie's a superstar? I think no. Kyrie. Could, you could. You could argue maybe is a superstar, but I don't know. Like you know, what are you saying? Maybe Jason Tatum in the future. Who else? Yeah, I'm the- talking about Tatum, and then I'm saying like they could. They have the possibility of adding a third superstar based off the assets that they have. Right, so that's yeah. why I said, that's why I said, potentially a third superstar, you know. But I think I think Kyrie's a superstar. They added a whenever any time that you manage to uh, in the NBA, if you if it's a saying that Max Kellerman likes to use, if you can if you can get a dollar for four quarters, you take that deal because a dollar is not worth four quarters in the NBA. A superstar is not worth four role players, no matter how good they are. And I think that's what uh, Danny Ainge was able to do. And I think that it, like you know being able to fleece uh, yet another Eastern Conference team. And not only make his team better, but severely, severely damage the title hopes of his leading competitor in his own conference. I mean, you 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 can't get much well, better than that. Well, he he did at first, but not anymore. I mean, the, with the injury, the Celtics are out in the first round. I, at least I think. I mean, it, honestly, and you initially, could argue LeBron's better this. See, I mean, I'm not saying this for a fact. I'd have to look into it deeper. But you could argue LeBron's having a better season this year because Kyrie's not there. You can argue that, but I, are you telling me you think the, the Cavaliers are a better team this season? I'm telling no, you, I think LeBron's having a better season. I'm, I don't think the Cavaliers, and I don't think it's just Kyrie. And I think if they kept Kyrie on the roster and they did the same thing that they did this year, they'd probably be in a similar situation. They'd have more offensive firepower, but I don't think we'd still think they'd have a shot at beating Golden State. I think the r- issues with the Cavs roster has a lot to do with defense more so than offense. Not saying that Kyrie doesn't make them a better team, but the fact that the Cavs weren't going to beat Golden State this year if they had kept Kyrie either. Yeah, but with Kyrie, we're talking about them, you know, okay, well, they're going to get their, their lock for the finals. Without Kyrie, we're talking about them losing potentially in the first round if they have to play a team like Philly. Uh, I, I still don't – I mean, 
that's, no, that's I'm a not different saying that's debate for the player group recast. I'm, I'm not saying that's, I mean, yeah, we're getting way off topic here, but I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just saying that, you know, that's not, that was not, that wasn't even a discussion before Kyrie left. I, I, I think, I think the, what Boston was able to do to Cleveland damaged them enough to say that Danny Ainge deserved it. And I think the accumulation of pieces that he was able to add and the accumulation of talent he was able to add while staying in a flexible position, that's what does it for me. I can see the argument for Daryl Morey. I, I just, for me, it's, it's it's Danny Ainge. I think the fact is, like, we're looking at it differently in the sense that I agree that probably Danny Ainge had the better offseason long-term, but when you say long-term, there's always hypotheticals that you don't know possible things that happen, players could get worse. Or so I think when you're talking executive of the year, you have to look at it for this season and what's happening this year. And the fact that Daryl Morey took the Houston Rockets from being a possible contender, you know, borderline, a lot of people didn't really believe in them. And to a lot of, you know, I would say majority of people who follow the NBA and root for the NBA still think Houston is that possible threat that could knock out Golden State, especially if Steph isn't healthy. And I think that's a big thing to do in an era where we didn't think. I think we're kind of forgetting in the sense last year, going to the finals and going in the postseason, nobody thought Golden State could even possibly, they could, could have swept the entire playoffs. You know, the Cavs, what, they beat them one game? Like this year, I think we all agree that Houston is not going to get probably swept by Golden State. I agree with you, but and and, and don't get me wrong, it's 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 not that I don't think that that Boston's the better team or, or sorry that Houston's a better team or anything like that. I just think that a lot of what made Houston what they are today wasn't because of Daryl Morey. It was more to do with the system that's in place, uh, thanks to Mike D'Antoni, the recruiting done by the players in Houston, Chris Paul's little you know, uh, black magic that he pulled to get himself traded to 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 Houston in the first place. I don't know how much credit I give Daryl Morey for pulling it all off. Not that not that he doesn't get credit. It was I'm a pretty saying. complicated trade, though. It wasn't it, like the simplest. It was. It, it was. It, I'm not, and I'm not saying it, I'm not saying he doesn't deserve credit for that. But what I'm saying is, if you look at the entire and, and again, the, the executive can't control what happens to the players on the on the court. The, all the, the executive can control is their ability to swing deals to make their team more talented. And I think looking at what they accomplished, you know, throughout the off season and throughout the right, the, the regular season, I think Danny Ainge, from my perspective, did more to help his franchise than Daryl Morey did to help his franchise. I think Houston were already there. They were ready to be a legitimate contender. They just needed, a, you know, a little bit of a push to get over the edge. Whereas I think, Regardless of their position in the standings last season, Boston was a mile away. And I think Danny Ainge has put them so much closer to being in that conversation. Whereas Daryl Morey, for me, just me personally, didn't do as much to make his franchise a better a better franchise. And I think, in, I think in you totality, agree that it's harder to jump from being a borderline contender to being a true contender than it is to go from being, you know, uh, a very good team to being a borderline contender with the Celtics are. I think we're just disagreeing in terms of short-term, long-term for the thing. Like, I agree long-term, Danny Ainge probably made the better moves, but they haven't come to fruitation yet because he still has to make the picks with the new picks. You know, Tyree still has to stay healthy. We're so Daryl Morey and the Rockets are already in a better position to win a championship this year. But let's talk coach of the year. I, this I, is a very interesting I just want to say, well, I just want to say one more thing before. You, I've been letting you guys just go at it. That was great. <laughs> I just, I'm just sitting back with my popcorn watching the first take. <laughs> Um, Terrell but, Owens. <laughs> yeah, right. But um, I think one thing I want to mention is, you know, I think Danny Ainge probably did set everything up better. But, you know, Danny Ainge has been pretty adamant about that they're not trying to win a title now, that, you know, they're still re- – like, even last year, he said, we're rebuilding. And I still think that's been the sense around the Celtics is they're still getting – you know, they have all these treasure chests of assets. They're still getting the young guys to win in the future. So whether or not they, you know, advance out of the first round this year, if they do have a deep playoff run, you know, that's really just, you know, that's like an applause because Danny Ainge realizes that the best teams are still out West, whereas Daryl Morey realized that he has a superstar and that if he got one or two more guys around him, that he could actually try and win a title now. So I think it's also just part of like both executives have a different focus on what their team is doing in the recent, in the near future and, you know, now. And that's all I want to add. All right. Uh, let's move on to the next one before we give the guys, uh, the fans and guys and girls, a two hour show. <laughs> <laughs> Coach of the year. All right. This is one I actually, I will say, I'm kind of at a toss up with that I originally was really locked on one guy, but I want to hear your guys' takes and then I'll kind of make my final choice after that. Uh, uh, okay. So you want to go first, John? Sure. I'll, I'll go first on this one because I know my pick isn't a very popular pick, but. Uh... It's one that I, I feel pretty strongly about. Um, see, I kind of look at the, 
the coaching award a little bit differently from most people. I'm not as concerned with what the team's final record was. I'm not concerned as much uh, with, uh, per se, what the winning record was. I'm more concerned with what I saw uh, and how many coaches, you know, we talk about win shares. I, I brought that up earlier. But how many coaches are, you know, the most important part of their how their team works and, you know, is the system what wins them games? And I think for this season, uh, Greg Popovich would be my coach of the year. Now, an argument could be made that he should deserve to win the award every year. But in my opinion, with what has gone on in that franchise this season, something that they're definitely not used to dealing with, he has still managed to keep his team of, you know, his band of misfit, misfits afloat in the, the Western Conference. They were in that third seed almost all season, and it's they've kind of slipped a little bit in the standings. Uh, partly due to uh, how well um, the Trailblazers are playing, how, partly how well uh, Utah and the Pelicans, I mean, Anthony Davis has just been a one-man wrecking crew. But with who they have on their roster, with the players that they have, the fact that they are still one of the best teams in the Western Conference is mind-blowing to me. And the job that he's done keeping everybody in check, making sure everybody goes out and plays their role and plays their position, you know, there are guys on the – uh, San Antonio, like important players on the San Antonio Spurs that most casual fans wouldn't even be able to recognize if they saw him in a grocery store. Like <laughs> the fact that this team, it is true. And he does it every single year. You know, Tony Parker's, you know, been in and out of the, uh, the lineup. You know, he gets the absolute best out of guys like Patty Mills. Kawhi Leonard has played all, but I think it's nine games this season. And he has still managed to keep that team in the mix, playing well, working hard. And, you know, I, I just think he deserves the credit this season. This had, this might be the best coaching job of Greg Popovich's entire career. That's saying a lot. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I, I, th I mean, you, you mentioned it before. Popovich is definitely always in the conversation. Like, if you ever talk to anyone and they say Popovich isn't in their top three for coach of the year, they probably don't watch basketball. <laughs> I think Popovich always has to be in it, especially because, like, I mean, even a couple of years ago, you had David Lee as a main rotational player, and the Spurs were, what, like, top three in the conference? They had won um, 60 games, I think. Right. So, you know, he, he amazes with his, um, his adaptations to who is in the lineup, who is not in the lineup. Like you mentioned, Kawhi Leonard played 11, uh, nine games this year, John, and they've barely, you know, slipped at all. If anything, it's just because the teams around them have gotten better that they haven't been able to hold a, a specific spot in the seating. Uh, for me, you know, I, I go back and forth because, uh, like, for example, two weeks ago, I picked Dwayne Casey, or last week, whenever he was, it was Dwayne Casey. I still think Dwayne Casey is the coach of the year for me personally. Uh, the Raptors, obviously, they've had this constant – uh, you know, like last year, for example, uh, this is the team that's going to upset LeBron James. They were built to stop the King. And then in the playoffs happened. And obviously what, you know, what always happens, happens LeBron beat up the Raptors and they moved on um, this year, going into the season, many people, uh, including myself thought Dwayne Casey is probably on the hot seat. Who knows? Like, you know, if this year didn't go well, he might be on the outside looking in. And currently he's, you know, solidified himself, I think for at least another year safe in Toronto because of the year they've had. Um, and like you mentioned, uh, when we talked about rookie of the, uh, not rookie of the year, six man of the year, you know, Fred Van Leet, all those bench players who have been huge for Toronto, you know, that's a product of Dwayne Casey. Uh, Mar DeRozan has gotten better, obviously him adapting a three point shot to his game, becoming more of a playmaker. Uh, that's more of the player too, but that's a part of the coach, you know, Dwayne Casey changed their entire offense going into the season. You know, they've been trying to move the ball more. Uh, Kyle Lowry has been able to actually rest this season, whereas years past, he's had a ton of minutes. He's been, I believe, in the top five of minutes, played uh, three out of the last four seasons, if I remember reading that stat right the last night. Um, so they've been, you know, really good. But then I look over at the West, and with every win, you know, the last four or six wins, uh, Mike D'Antoni and the Rockets have, they set a franchise record. You know, Mike D'Antoni won the last year without setting franchise records and wins. So you can also you can make a case that he wins. Um, I'm leaning towards Dwayne Casey, but I would not be shocked or surprised if Mike D'Antoni wins back to back Coach of the Year. Yeah, honestly, this seems like every year there's just so many great Coach of the Year candidates. Like John said, Popovich, you said Casey, Brad Stevens got to be in there as well. Terry Stotts. I mean, you can even Terry make a case for Terry Stotts too. You'll probably point. get a few votes for your Pacers. Not Quinn Snyder. Quinn Snyder. Yeah, that's another guy I love. 
I think he's one of probably the most underappreciated guys. But I think the fact that Jonathan is a Toronto guy and he didn't pick Casey and he picked Popovich, and I know how much he watches the Raptors and breaks them down, that it definitely swayed me toward Popovich. And I think the fact is, I don't know if we could say any other team in the NBA could lose a top five player, their best player, clearly their best player, and a you know some might say a top three, a top five player in this league where he's impacting the game offensively and defensively and still having a playoff type season. Take any, you know, other than the Warriors who are blessed with a million, a million stars, you know, take, take us, take James Harden off the Rockets, take LeBron off the Cavs, take uh, Westbrook off OKC. You know, are those teams even making the playoffs? Probably not. That's why I think that's why like Pop, uh, Pop, I think has to get the award, I guess. You know, I wasn't 100% locked in, but John kind of convinced me in thinking about it. Just the fact that Kawhi's only played nine games. And how many teams actually could have such a great season without having a consistent point guard play? Like you mentioned, Tony Parker's been in and out. DeJounte Murray's struggled during the seasons. He's had some nice flashes as well. Patty Mills hasn't been that guy they need him to be to step up and be a starting type point guard. So I think the fact that they're missing top three, top five player, and they're missing their point guard play, I think Pop's got to get the award. And the fact he's like brought LaMarcus Aldridge back to being a star instead of being that soft guy we saw in the playoffs. Most coaches wouldn't admit they were wrong with a guy, and he admitted it publicly that he made some mistakes with Aldridge. So I give him a lot of props for that. Yeah, I, I mean, here, let me just, like, rattle off uh, a few things about Dwayne Casey. I, it's not that I don't think he's a, he's a, he is a good coach, and I think he deserves a lot of credit for what he was able to do in terms of changing their offense uh, this season. But if looking at looking at the Raptors, if I could make an improvement in one area of that team, you know, unfortunately, the area I'd make the improvement in is, is, is the coaching. And I think wow. that I think that Dwayne Co- Dwayne Casey is is he's an unimaginative head coach when it comes to the offensive end. And I think I, I, as a Raptors fan, regardless of the fifty seven wins, I am genuinely worried about how they're going to play in the playoffs when the rotation shrinks and that bench can't bail them out when they're playing against weak uh, weak benches. Here's here's a stat that I want to throw at you, Corey, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Toronto, the, the Raptors' record against teams that are above 500 is 24 and 20. Wow. And the, 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 the reason that's a, a red flag for me is because when it comes down to, uh, you know, the end of the game, when it's starting to get, you know, tight and uh, every basket counts, the Raptors always seem to revert back to this DeMar DeRozan, Kyle Lowry, ISO handoff, you know, your turn, my turn, your turn, my turn. The entire offense breaks down. And to me, the responsibility for that falls on the head coach. He's the one who calls the shots. He's the one calling the plays. And that's not going to win them basketball in the playoffs. So for me, the fact that they won 57 games, I mean, they were 33-2 and two against teams under 500. And to me, that just doesn't impress me as much as, you know, having a, a limited roster and uh, pulling off what he was able to do, like just to give you some idea of, of how the Spurs played this season, they're first in the in, they're first in the league in opponent points per game. They're third in defensive rating. He has five players in double digit scoring. Only one player on the Spurs roster is playing third more than thirty minutes a game. He's got thirteen different players averaging ten plus minutes a game. I mean, to to have that kind of production from that kind of cast, it, there's just something next level about it. I mean, we can talk about the roster on Toronto. Kyle Lowry, DeMar DeRozan, uh, CJ Miles, uh, Serge Ibaka, Jonas Valanciunas, all those guys are big time players and none of them are are superstars in this league, but every single one of those guys can put up serious, serious production on any given night. And I just think that with the lack of star power that they have on, on San Antonio and what they were able to accomplish, I just that's where I think the edge goes. That's a good point. I that that's a lot that I wasn't really. I mean, I don't pay a ton of. I mean, I obviously watch Toronto. I watch a lot of Eastern Conference games because I'm a baby and can't stay up till two <laughs> o'clock in the morning watching basketball every night. But um, I, I I had read recently that they they definitely struggled against the top uh, teams. I wasn't real aware that it was like you know twenty four and twenty. That's um, that is alarming. That, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's extremely alarming because you're not playing bad teams in the playoffs. You're playing yeah. above 500 teams. Um, and I, what you mentioned about the the hero ball um, near the end of games, I've definitely noticed that. When was it they played the Cavs the other night? Uh, it was 
two two nights ago, was it? Right. I, you saw a little bit of that in that fourth quarter of them, you know, kind of reverting back to that old ways of, well, let's try and have, you know, the guys bail us out. Um, so, yeah, that, that definitely changes things in my mind slightly. It makes me lean more towards D'Antoni. Uh, Who deserves yeah, a so- lot of credit, by the way. I, I, he didn't get really mentioned much in during this segment, but I, I think he deserves a lot of credit as well. And if, and if D'Antoni was out of the mix, I would, I would say D'Antoni uh, – or sorry, if Pop was out of the mix, D'Antoni would be my next, uh, my next pick. Yeah, I think the fact you got Chris Paul and James Harden to work so well together, bringing a lot of new pieces, everybody was questioning that move, you know, how these guys work. So I think that was a big deal, too, and just offensively an incredible season and James Harden possibly having an MVP-type season, which we're going to talk about right now. Who is your MVP of this NBA season? Jonathan also does the MVP race all year for OTG, so make sure you check out that. He does a great job kind of breaking down. He doesn't even just look at who's the MVP. He looks at the top 10 candidates. So very something cool to check out. But who you got as MVP for your announcement, John, before the article drops? So, yeah, uh, like Nick said, the the MVP race, the final uh... – the final article of the, the season is going to be dropping tonight, so make sure you check that out. I'll give you the top three uh, on the pod, but make sure you check out the article to f- uh, see the full ten uh, top ten candidates. So at number three for the season, I got Anthony Davis. Uh, he's my uh, runners-up, runner-up. Um, he had an amazing season. For me, what hurt Anthony Davis is the fact that he kind of came on towards the end of the season, and yep. before DeMarcus Cousins went down, you could make the argument DeMarcus Cousins was their most valuable player. Not saying he was. I'm just saying the argument could have been made. I think that's what hurt Anthony Davis. Uh, number two on the list was, of course, King James. Uh, phenomenal season. Arguably, I know that hurts you to put LeBron at number two. I know it, it, it does. It does. It, 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 it's like a knife in my heart, Nick. But, <laughs> you know, he's had a great season, but the team has just been uh, a shade shy of where they've been uh, – in previous seasons, I mean, they're holding on to the, you know, they're barely holding on to home court in the playoffs at this point. And, and that really hurts LeBron, especially because uh, the guy at number one, uh, a player who is putting up very similar to production to uh, LeBron James uh, should come as no surprise to anybody. James Harden, he's been an absolute monster this season. Arguably this should be his third MVP award, but he'll for sure get this one. I don't think there's any doubt about it. Uh, great season for him, great season for the Rockets. He's a catalyst for, you know, arguably one of the greatest offenses in NBA history, and, and he 100% deserves the award. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I think James Harden is the MVP. I think I said this, I've said this numerous times now. I think he is the uh, unanimous MVP, the second career unanimous MVP. Um, I, I don't think anyone else should get votes for, especially before the fact that he probably should have won last year. Uh, he probably should have won the year Steph won, or at least one of the years of Steph won. Um, no, he's been great. He's been – you can't – even when Chris Paul went down for Houston, you know, James Harden carried the load, and that team didn't even skip a beat without Chris Paul. And then Chris Paul got back, and they got even better. Um, obviously, the numbers are very similar to LeBron. I think if the Cavaliers had had a little more success this second half, or even when James Harden missed um, – what he missed, two weeks with a pulled calf or a pulled hamstring – Yep. Uh, it was the same time where LeBron was kind of slumping. I think if LeBron had had probably a really good two weeks when James Harden was out, it may have helped you know elevate him in this really you know it's probably a closer rate a, a rate closer rate <laughs> than people realize because these two have been balling out all year. Um, but I think you know yeah James Harden's got the slight edge I think over LeBron between the team having so much success and him obviously uh, putting up similar numbers to last year minus the triple double. Yeah, I agree. And I agree with the fact that I I was on the show last year and I said James Harden should have had one MVP. And I think it becomes a little bit more obvious this year with the way Russell Westbrook's playing and him having similar stats. I'm not trying to take anything away from Westbrook, but Harden's MVP last year for me and Harden's MVP for this year. And like you guys mentioned, LeBron's been putting up huge numbers. I think one thing that really hurt LeBron, I believe it was the month of January where he only averaged like 23 a game. The Cavs went six and eight. Just wasn't a very good stretch. If he had played this way all season long, and it also helps, you know, the storyline in the sense that LeBron's playing some of his best basketball right now where the Cavs need wins, where so Houston's kind of taking their foot off the pedal a little bit, knowing that they already have the number one seed locked up. So I think that's kind of created some hype, but James Harden's MVP for him, for me. And I also think it's very impressive that Harden lost MVP last year, and he also had that embarrassing performance against San Antonio in the playoffs. And instead of kind of, you know, getting worse, he kind of bounced back and had an even better season than last year in a sense. 
And maybe that has something to do with it. Maybe that, you know, maybe that's part of what's driving him this season to, you know, maybe he realizes he can't do it all by himself or, or something like that. But yeah, I, I just want to shout out Russell Westbrook. Uh, you mentioned him last season or, or him winning the MVP last season. Um, he is 0.1 rebounds shy of averaging a triple double again this season. And nobody's talking about it. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. The whole triple double thing, I think, lost a little bit of hype after we did it last year. So, but yeah. uh, one one more stat I like to throw in for Harden that I think impressed me. Obviously, having Chris Ball makes this a little bit better. He averaged five point seven turnovers last year. He cut that down to four point three, which is still a lot. But in that high octane offense and the amount of times he has the ball in his hands, you know, it's not that bad. And the fact I think Harden's had what four fifty point games this year, which is very impressive to have in one season. Sometimes we don't even see four across the entire NBA season overall by everybody. But uh, any other MVP candidates you want to show some love to? Obviously, I think I agree with Jonathan in the sense that it goes hard in LeBron, AD. Who would be? I know John will save yours for the article. Corey, any guys for you you want to throw in there? I mean, I think Lillard deserves to be uh, in the top five, or at least just outside the top five. I mean, I don't think anyone had Portland being a three seed currently in the West. I didn't. I, think, I didn't. Yeah. So Portland's been fantastic. Lillard, especially. Um, obviously, he has those really slow starts to this to the year. And then post All Star break, he flips the switch, man, and he becomes a lethal assassin. Uh, obviously, he's down with a calf injury, I believe, right now, or an ankle injury. But you know, when he's been on the floor, he's been fantastic for the Blazers. Uh, so I think he's got to be in the top five. And then, I mean, make your pick, Curry or Durant. Uh, I think both of those guys deserve MVP nods every year uh, to some degree. Obviously, Curry's missed a lot of games this year. Um, but when he's on the floor, you feel his impact. You There's never a time where you don't feel Stephen Curry on the floor. And then with Durant, um, I feel like he's kind of been slept on this year to a degree. I feel like Durant's become slightly underrated for whatever reason. Maybe because we all know OKC is so good that Durant kind of just falls in the back shadow. But uh, I think those two guys as well should be you know either in the top five or right outside of the top five. Yeah, definitely. A ton of guys always having great season. And Dame's just like... I don't know, like you, I've, I've said this before on the show, like you think Portland, you think Dame Lillard, especially right now. But to recap all the picks, Rookie of the Year, uh, Ben Simmons for myself and Jonathan Corey went with uh, Donovan Mitchell. Six man, we all agreed on Lou Will. Defensive Player of the Year, uh, Corey and I went with Rudy Gobert and Jonathan went with Anthony Davis. Most Improved Player, we all agreed on Victor Oladipo. Executive of the Year, I went with Daryl Morey. Uh, Corey went with Daryl Morey and uh, Jonathan went with Danny Ainge. Coach of the Year, Popovich for Jonathan and I, and Corey, you're going with Casey or D'Antoni? <laughs> uh, I'm going to lock in a D'Antoni. He's going to lock in D'Antoni, and then MVP, and honestly, we all picked James Harden. So I want to thank you, John, for ruining my um, belief, my pat, my pat, finally getting on the Raptors bandwagon a little bit. So thank <laughs> hey, you. Stay on the Raptors you possibly bandwagon. Stay on the Raptors bandwagon. <laughs> right, I'll be on the bandwagon, but not Dwayne Casey's. All right? Just maybe get off the Casey bandwagon. <laughs> <laughs> But that wraps up for today. Jonathan, Corey, excellent show. Thank you guys for taking the time to do this. And as always, thank everybody for listening. You can listen to us on iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, OTGBasketball.com, Google Play, and now airing on Dash Radio. Have a wonderful NBA postseason, everybody. Thanks for having me on, guys. It's always a pleasure. Always the highlight of my season talking about this stuff with you guys. Have a great weekend. I'm taking off like the Portland Trailblazers.